Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of PIP, People in Property. Today we've got a special guest with us, Isaac. Isaac is actually one of our landlords who we met five, six years ago and a very good friend of my business partner Ayrton. Now Isaac came to us as a landlord, we, we left the property, we started managing it um, and then he sort of broke from there, bought a couple more units, sent them across our way and he sort of developed his property knowledge as such across the years. Um, I want to head over to now, Isaac, hand the mic to you if you like as such, and give us a little bit of history of where you started, because I know you're not, you don't really have a property background, you've built your knowledge across the last few years. Yeah, of course. Cool. So, um, worked in finance since 2012. Um, that was my first taster of understanding kind of there's a bigger world out there when it comes to money. Um, it's interesting when you work in a branch, because you tend to see the money come in. So, who tended to come in, who had the money, it was property investors, it was people who were buying another property, people who had owned half the street and every time the, the bank manager was like, oh, do you know that person owns this? Do you know that person owns that? So I think that started to plant a seed, mm -hmm. but a little bit further back than that. So I'm, I'm Ugandan, so my mum buys land um, back home right. and she's always taken our money, our hard earned money, <laughs> and she's gone and bought land thousands of miles away yeah. and told us this is a long term investment. So a lot of those seeds were planted quite early. So I always knew I was going to be in property, but good. yeah, exactly. I'd, I didn't quite know how. Um, and then it started building from there. Is It started with curiosity. How do people do this? And I started building from there, yeah. Brilliant. So really, it sounds like your mom planted the seed originally with the side of, you know, in Uganda, investing in the land, buy some other things, do some development properties out there. Yeah. Which is always fabulous to have your investments in more than one, one place, being that you're in finance and knowing about, you know, having investment in money working for you as such. Diversify your portfolio. So... You obviously wanted to divide, diversify your portfolio. Mark was really sort of dip, dip in, dipping their toes into the property side of things in another country. You sort of started becoming a landlord um, and you sort of had the know-how of people coming into you and seeing that the investment was working in property. I mean, who wouldn't want to own half a street? Exactly. I mean, I, I, the, the, the thing is, it's, it started a lot more humble than that as well because it was the idea of owning half a street probably wasn't the ambition. I think it was the idea of being able to not just rely on a earned income. That was the real fundamentals for me. It's it's this idea that you could actually make money elsewhere and it didn't have to be some sort of hustle and bustle, you know, selling products and stuff like that. And you could actually buy an asset and it pays you for the long term. So a lot of those a lot of those things just logically made sense to me. So was it that sort of retirement fund you had in your mind saying, you know what, I don't want to have to essentially work forever and have to earn the pound over myself being in a in a work environment, but I'm happy to earn the money, but so let me invest that and have something that can generate me money on the side while I'm sleeping, grow it, grow in equity, create a bit of cash flow, um, and hopefully be a little retirement pension fund as such. Yeah, so so it, it, it really was initially, initially. I mean, that my mindset's changed massively since then, but I think when you're, when you're quite naive, but you're looking at it from the outside in, it's very much, I want to quit my job buying X and I want to be able to you know, have the income coming in and, and basically cover all my needs. Pension pot, I probably wanted to retire early. That's yeah. the best way to, to kind of describe the pension pot to some extent. Um, yeah, that, but that's 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 a long time ago. But my mindset's moved a lot because I think I like to work for my money. Um, yeah. Whether whether I'm helicopter managing or whether I'm in, in the trenches, the idea of just exiting and not doing anything um i mean that's 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 my ideal hell now <laughs> it be, i'm twiddling folks thinking oh exactly what i'm doing today yeah so tell us a bit about your day-to-day -day now like, what, are you still in the finance finance the street side of things i am that? yes i am so so i'm a business development manager for buy to let lender uh, a well-known buy to let lender in the uk at the same time um i'm a landlord um of, of course you you know you manage my properties down south I've got a few properties up north as well that um, I've got a joint venture partnership um, where we decided to, to start doing that. Um, on top of that, I think in between, I tried to keep work focused within the nine to five. And then outside of that is kind of just the property side of things and just managing and staying on top of things, nice. regulations, all of that stuff. What made you, obviously, you've got, we know you've got the stuff down south. I know we touched about your, you told me you was buying up north and stuff. What made you want to go up north? Because... We have different stories. I mean, I don't personally invest up north. All my stuff is in south. Yeah. Stuff with all this reach that I can deal with myself if need be. Um, and, you know, it's just sometimes difficult to stay on top of things that are not within your reach. What made you want to go up north? Did you think there's good returns? Was it the equity growth? Well, you know, what, what made you want to go up north? Two things. So 
the the idea of clo managing something that's close to home i had have been to one of my properties that you you manage very very well i hadn't had to go there for the best part of two years um as in physically go there um you know obviously you send me the videos you you tell me when there's there's an issue and then i'm i proactively fix it or you know, we, we agree who, who the contractor is that goes down. First of having a great agent, right? <laughs> it, it does help. But it, it, it's also, that was an example to me of, to some extent, remote investing, even though I was only 10 minutes down the road. So I, I, I kind of took that thought process and said, well, if I did invest up north, how many times would I actually, how many touch points would I actually have at the property? Probably not as many as most people think. And I don't self-manage. Everything I do is about trying to systemize it in the best way possible because my time is limited. So that was that was point number one. The second point is it wasn't to do with returns. Returns is always fundamental, so it's a bit commonsensical, but it was more to do with diversifying a lot of investments going up north. The government is looking up north, um, you know, the northern project. There's a there's a development bank that's being built for funding to go up north. And I would probably say most of the flow of cash, apart from the attraction of London and down south, a lot of the flow of cash moving forward in the next 10 years is going to be north. I want I want part of that pie. I don't I, I I'm not obsessed with being a massive landlord up there. I just want a few I wanted a few units so I get a bit of whatever does come along and obviously take you know you've got the responsibilities of looking after the place as well. So so the equity growth is what you're looking in the long term out in north. Yeah. And obviously the diversifying the portfolio as such. You've got stuff going on in Uganda, you've got stuff down south, stuff up north. So God forbid if one of them was to go pear shaped, you've got the other two that's still holding you sturdy as such. Yeah. That sounds great. That sounds great. Now, also recently, you've been doing a lot of um, learning. Yes. Uh, and that's one thing that I love about you. You're not adverse to go putting yourself out there, whether it's networking, which we sort of did on Clubhouse. I remember you sort of took a really good stead on that when the Clubhouse got launched. You, know, so you sort of set yourself up on there as someone that could speak to people, uh, that people could come to you uh, to talk about the finance side of things, talk about the investment side of things, and give give back as such a little bit of what you've learned and you've even been delving more into that in the last six months I think to a year yeah. uh, and learn new things tell us a little bit about what you're learning about because I think it's like tower blocks um uh, multi-unit purchases and stuff like that if I'm not mistaken for me yeah no 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 you're right so the, a lot of a lot of so flats has always been an interest of mine because maybe I don't know if it's a contrarian view or, or just looking at things a little bit different to everyone else. Everyone wants a freehold block, uh, sorry, a free a freehold house, two up, two down. Everyone's looking for the same thing. So with the, the beauty about flats is that in a up, in an upward market, maybe not, not, maybe not, not as popular as you would want them to be in a downward market, very popular because actually the demand for them are, are a lot less in, re, in regards to, sorry, the wrong way around. So in an upwards market, People want flats in a downward market. They don't, but the rent stays the same. Yeah. So, and what we find that actually, yeah, clutch on that is rents now are going ridiculously high. Yeah, because not all people are buying, as you said. There's not really much demand for it. So, what's happening now is because there are many new buy to let levels coming on the scene. Yeah, providing the accommodation for tenants, we're now finding that rents are starting to sort of just increase yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah. So the e economics are going the right direction with flats, but I think a lot of that has, has always been there. Flats have always, if, if you're in a, if you want to live in an area that you cannot access because you can't afford a house that has a garden and all of that stuff, you're going to go for a flat. Whether you are a small family, whether you're a couple, it tends to be a nice start, a place to live. So I think it's always been a good product, but it's some for some reason, when you go to the training courses, it's never really talked about. So I think I, I I always saw that I grew up in a flat. Flats a, a flat made sense to me. So I've never been too worried about the product itself. When I started learning more about the customer, I always knew that there is always a customer for a flat because not everyone can afford or there is there's going to be a lack of supply for houses. So that's that's where the fundamentals came from in terms of wanting to learn a bit more. We purchased our first uh, block um, in January last year. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you, you you managed one of the units in there. <laughs> so so we purchased our first block and that was really interesting because by buying the block, we were able to actually get a discount on the two units. If we had bought them separately, we would have probably paid 20, 30,000 pounds more for each unit. So that that kind of opened up my eyes that actually if you buy in bulk, you can your negotiation position is better, but also there was hardly any customers who wanted it. First time buyers can't buy a block. Um, Obviously, investors can, but then they're, they're probably looking at it saying it's it's a lot of work. So it cuts out the small investors and you're probably looking at your mid. 
So we were able to negotiate a lot better, get good terms, and effectively get that get that unit across the road during the pandemic. So it, it worked out really well, and that 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 opened up my eyes. And then now I I want to understand how to basically buy a whole block, any size more or less, and turn it into an opportunity that other people can't see. And that's the reason why I did the course I did. Brilliant. So obviously your competition is less, as you say, yeah. bond buyer blocks. Uh, we have more opportunity there. So little key key points there for people that are sort of looking to get in. But I wouldn't suggest maybe for first time buyers such because they can't really get on the ladder buying blocks as such. But Again, buy it flats. People do shy away from that. With they're like, oh, it's not freehold, it's not my. But look, there are a lot of long leases in place at the moment, and governments try to bring in the play in, into play where you know everything's going to be on a line, line, line. At least it hasn't come into play yet, but there are talks of it. Um, and if that does happen, then it's a no-brainer. You know, if you can't afford to buy a house, and most houses are very expensive, um, then you you want to get on the ladder somewhere, in some some shape or some form. So getting yourself a flat just makes sense. Now. Touching on you buying blocks, are you looking to do that individually? Are you looking to sort of have a consortium as such? Would you bring other people in on it? Because um, I think um, Grant Cardone, I don't know if you follow him or not, yeah, he does a lot of like multi, they call it multi-home dwellings in, yeah. in America. Um, and they don't sort of buy individual units, they buy blocks and then he sort of gets people to invest in. Is that the kind of model that you're trying to do yourself as well? Yes. So uh, it, I... I I've always collaborated. I'm, I'm a big collaborator because I've, I've, I've got a very limited, finite amount of time. I've got a finite amount of understanding, skills, abilities. So it's trying to find those those people who are in my network or in, in a network that I'm going to build in the future who have those resources or those skills who can plug those gaps. And I think you move quicker that way. I, I, I love JVs. I, I love working with other people. But at the same time, I'm willing to do it on my own. So a lot of this stuff that I'm doing is not so much about how I'm going to do it in terms of whether I'm going to work with someone or not. It's the fact that I'm going to do it and the rest will figure itself out. Yeah. So I am putting in those offers. I am talking to a lot of different types of people, people with money, people who have specific types of skills. And when the time comes, we'll pull that all together and we'll do something. But that doesn't deter me from just finding the deal, doing those, <laughs> sorry, doing those numbers, yeah. putting, the, putting those offers in because... That's, that's really what's going to attract the rest. Definitely. A, a little worst case scenario, if you do put an offer in, it gets accepted, but you're not in a financial position to be able to buy it yourself. Yeah. Being that your background is finance, you can look, turn around and say, I found this deal. Would you be interested in, in buying it? Yeah. My cut is going to be 5%, 2%, whatever it may be. So you can still earn, grow your knowledge at the same time uh, and then grow your portfolio a little bit as well. Or say to them, look, you know what? I want to be a little 1% partner. Yeah. I'm not going to take a feel for you. I wanted to put me down as a shareholder and then, you know, the profits will take a little bit out of it and you're a sub owner that way. So great ideas that you have there. And they do always say network is in network. So, and um, I found that within the Jewish community as such as well, they do a lot of that. So we've got some clients ourselves that we deal with, you know, one of them is very good at doing the deal as in you know, number crunching, liaising with ourselves as agents or other agents and yeah. getting a deal done where it's getting money off the deal as such. And then they've got a partner who does the build out for them. They've got a partner that sort of sets the companies up to the out accounting. Yeah. So, and they will come together, but they're all growing at the same time. So yep. you'll find that they have special purpose vehicles, SPVs, they call it, uh, which are limited companies set up left, right, and center. And you, you know, every time we do a new deal, it's like a new limited company. So yep. I think, what's going on here? And it's all sort of plugging things and putting things together into perspective that, you know what, they're all coming together. They're all bringing something to ten. Some of them might not even put any money down, yeah. but they're very knowledgeable yeah. and they know how to get it across the line, which is fabulous and great to see that you're doing it because we'll probably do some deals in the future. Yeah, 100%. Well. 100%. Where do you uh, see yourself sort of going from here? Um, I know you're sort of doing back-to-back -back meetings all the time, meeting new people, obviously building your network, but you're, I know you said you sort of want to have a big portfolio and diverse, but what... What is your sort of main main goal? What is it that you're looking to get out, out of, you know, this journey as such? Do you know what? A good friend of mine asked me a very similar question on the weekend. And um, I, I articulate re really simply. It used to be the, the, the line that everyone says, fresh off, off the back of a course, financial freedom. I want to be able to be on a beach and manage my business from afar. I have no interest in none of that. I want a life of options, simple as. So if I choose to work in social housing because I want to improve the social housing landscape, which is something that is quite close to my heart, I can choose to do that. If I want to become a commercial de developer or director, I've got the choice to do that because I think one thing I've, I've, I've learned about myself in the process of learning so many things is I don't have a limit to what I believe I could understand and then implement. 
because I'm interested in a lot of things. And I used, I used to try and put myself in a pot, you know, Simon Sinek, find your why. Yeah. You, you then put pressure on yourself and you go, I need to find out what my why is. But the reality is some, some people are blessed to just have a wide scope of understanding. And that's, that's my only focus is understand more so I can do more and create the options by having assets that are there that can supplement to make sure that you're not burdened by the fact that you have to pay bills or you're burdened by the fact that you have to pay the mortgage. Therefore, you can't make that decision. And that, those are the things that I focus on a lot more. That is brilliant. That is quite powerful, actually, because like I said, a lot of people will just say, oh, yeah, I want to retire to go to the beach. And for you to say, you know what, I want to be able to have the option to do whatever I want. And um, they say knowledge is power. You're building your power because you're, you're, you're literally learning on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, not just by courses. You're going and meeting people who have knowledge in different aspects and different elements, and you're adding that to your art artillery as such, um, and you're growing all the time. I I'm very impressed by it, to be fair, yeah. even with talking Verton and um, our, our wives and stuff, saying, you know, when we were Isaac, how many years ago, he was sort of working, just working, you know, thought, yeah, buy to let, I'll get by to let, and then you sort of developed and grown across across the years, and it's very impressive, and, and it, it would be nice to sort of get people to understand that and be more like you rather than sort of want to be you know, these people that sort of just have, you know, own the whole street and not do anything for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Although, you know, some people may find that appealing and stuff, but yeah, yeah it's great to be knowledgeable um, and it's great to, to sort of get these gems and these nuggets off you and uh, give the viewers a different perspective of how they can outlook on things and not put pressure on themselves to say, like you said, what is my why? Why am I doing this? You know, what do I have to do it for? Because some people don't know. Yeah. You know, it's like when you, you're at school as well, they say, you know, what do you want to be when you grow older? <laughs> Question, question for an eight-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the greatest thing to ask someone because you put pressure on yourself that's undue. Um, especially in times now where, you know, things are sort of changing. Yeah. The environment's changing. Uh, the markets are changing everywhere. So if we can sort of teach ourselves to be adaptable, yeah. to grow and to learn, which is essentially what you're doing all the time, mm. then you could be a comedian and go into whatever you want to do. Um, mm. So, yeah, that's, that, that is brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isaac, for coming on. That's uh, been a pleasure. Yeah. You've dropped up quite a few good things and I hope our viewers have enjoyed it. Guys, look, thank you very much for watching this episode. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. We'll put um, Isaac's social media um, links below so you can plug in and connect with him. Uh, he's always happy to speak to everyone and give them different information and knowledge. And never know, you could be his next JV partner or you could have a deal for him. So thank you for watching and we'll see you at the next one.